Okay, so we are going live. Uh, I'm just going to post a link into Twitter before we get started here. There we go. And all right, so we're live. So welcome to my podcast. Um, I, I don't actually know how to say your name. I want to make sure I know how to say your name <laughs> properly. I think it's pronounced Gabor. Technically, I tell English people that it's Gabor, but in reality, it's Gabor. Gabor? Like, I mean, that's fine. Right? I'll call you Gabor. That's okay. actually what I thought originally, <laughs> that it was Gabor. Um, but I corrected myself later for some reason. I don't know why. Anyway, I think I got it now. So most of you probably already know who this is. Yeah, he's uh, he's kind of a legend on Reddit, on Stack Overflow. He's known for his very long and very detailed answers to uh, seemingly random questions. Just like very, very high amounts of effort for, uh, for the community. Um, so again, here's Gabor. And welcome to the podcast. It's uh, great to have you here. Hi, I'm glad to be here. I'm Zwinden on Reddit, Epic on the Force on Stack Overflow, and Zwinden on uh, Twitter. And that's pretty much where you find me. Also on GitHub, check out my navigation library. We might talk about it. We might not. It's great. You should you should look at it. Yeah, at least I, I hope it's great. We use it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. Um, I know what you're talking about. It's on my list of to dos. I have a very large list of to dos, but it it is pretty high on my list of to dos. But I definitely <laughs> want to take a look at it. It's called Simple Stack for those of you who uh, don't know what he's talking about. Yep. So, uh, so how are we going to start this? Well, I want to come back to that. And we'll talk about your library because I'm interested in it. But first, let's talk about how you got started as a developer. My my question personally is. How how long have you been working with Android? Because you seem to know so goddamn much. I'm I'm wondering how you acquired all of this knowledge, how you're able to fit it in here, how long that took. Time. It's a question of time, to be honest, and necessity. These two things. Because uh, originally, I started programming in high school, I guess. Like uh, I mostly started programming for two main reasons. One of them is that my brother was really good at programming he mm. also became a software developer he's my older brother mm. and i looked up to all the stuff he did and also i was told that hey software development pays well so you should probably look into that instead of whatever else you had in mind so i was like yeah sure that makes perfect sense so that's why i went to university computer engineering i have a bachelor's in that uh i finished in 2014 Okay. And I started an internship in 2014, February. And I ended up working there as a full-time employee afterwards when I finally got my degree and stuff. But I did not start with Android. I was hired for Android. I was not working with Android. Uh, I was working with Spring backend framework stuff. And uh, so Spring actually gives you a bunch of stuff out of the box like dependency injection is like a first class citizen you add component on one thing you add auto wired on this other thing and it gets injected so it's pretty much like singleton mm -hmm. and inject constructors and you put the inject in the other class and you just get it so it's easier well technically uh yes yes because it's reflection based because on servers it's a question of like startup time like mm -hmm. they, they don't really care if it takes 50 seconds to right. start up it's a server like whatever mm -hmm. on android you cannot wait 50 seconds which is why google juice eventually like uh went out of favor and they created dagger instead and then created dagger 2 instead so with with <laughs> regarding that reflection thing so on on a server with spring um complexity isn't an issue because uh, you know reflection probably isn't necessarily the 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 favorite among developers because it's sort of like it's not as structured right like you could call a class from anywhere using anything? Well, that's not really what I mean. Um, they use reflection to build a graph. Like when you start Spring, it looks up uh, what classes are annotated with oh, this thing okay. and this thing, and then it builds a graph and then constructs so everything for you. Okay. And there was also a method, uh, an annotation called post construct that would be called after the field injection happened if you used field injection. So that was a thing. Uh, so you don't use reflection for everything, but the framework okay. uses reflection for dependency injection and gotcha. resolving okay. the dependency graph. Okay. So so you had a pretty standard come up in terms of schooling and then getting a job. Like you yep. went, yeah, like you went to university. Hey, look, uh, internship, how nice. 
took the internship, <laughs> got it. I'm assuming it was a pretty good job because you haven't said anything negative about it. Well, technically, I quit three years later or four. Like, it was great until then. <laughs> okay. So, so you got hired as a Java guy, and then they said, hey, you're pretty good at Java. Android uses Java. Can we? Can you build an app for us or something like that? Uh, it was more like uh, I was hired for Android, but there were no Android projects. So they were like, oh, oh you're okay. in a Java because you're here for Android. So I guess you can do Spring. And I was like, yeah, sure, oh, okay. let's go with that. So I did that for like almost a year. Okay. And the first Android project we got was actually one where the client said, hey, we really like that you guys can make Android apps. Can you do this with like a hybrid stuff? Like mm, uh, web view yeah. based and HTML, JS, and CSS. And we were like, well, if that's what you really want, then sure, whatever. So that's what we did. And it, oh my God, it was so bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could imagine just kind of pieced together with like web views, basically, is probably what it was like. It was one web view. In a way, it was modern because it was single activity, right? There's only one web view. It works. Oh. Yeah, but there's so much trickery in there that was like completely broken. Like, uh, what the the real tricky thing is that this was a big company, so they were like, security is a thing that we want, so we want mm -hmm. client certificate authentication with SSL. That that was what they wanted. So we were like, okay, sure, let, let's go with that. What is that even? And then if you look at any documentation anywhere, it's just like, well, that's beyond the scope of this documentation. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that helps. <laughs> so yeah. that was a problem. I'm but sure that happened a lot. Bit. I'm sure that happened a lot back then. Like, like there was probably people say that Android development and like software development in general has become like very complex, very hard to learn. But I I don't know. I think back like I wasn't doing software development ten years ago. But I think mm -hmm. back ten years ago, five ten years ago, I can't imagine what it would have been like because the lack of documentation, the there's no like blog posts. I mean, you're not just going to go look something up on Medium and find a great article on it. Yeah, there was no Medium. Yeah. There was even a time when there was no Stack Overflow. Like, I cannot comment on that. I did not live in that era. Or at least I was not a you're pretty close. developer at that era. You're probably pretty close. How long, well, how long ago did you said 2013 you graduated? Uh, 2014. 2014. Yeah, I mean, that's probably pretty close. I bet. Mitch? No. Oh, medium. <laughs> um... So I hear that's pretty close, and then you went up. August You're 2012. Back. August 2012. So that's pretty close. Okay. That's when, yeah. So 2014. That's only a couple of years later. Yeah. So one thing about that story was that it was that was quite fun. Is that web views did not support client SSL authentication. Like they didn't, you, you could not execute a network request with client SSL. So what we had to do is yeah, add the JavaScript web API, yeah, uh, <laughs> JavaScript interface, sorry. Yeah, so a Java, JavaScript interface, which runs on the web views on thread and processes requests that come from JavaScript. And then we had to dispatch it and then do the network request on native side and then put it back. And then we had to realize that you have to escape it first and stuff like that. And the best thing was that in iOS, they made the same thing work. Eventually, the iOS guys just disappeared. So we had to like uh, put the iOS app together with Notepad. That was great. That was so, you did, so you did iOS? You <laughs> no, did iOS I was also. just, oh. I was, I mean, this was the benefit of hybrid that you could uh, like, uh, we diff util basically like diffing the two things together you could like make it work and then hopefully uh -huh. it works on oh, no. so uh, there were adventures there but that was in 2014 i yeah. started with real android in 2015. oh real yeah, android this, yeah yeah real <laughs> android that, so so <laughs> so with this real real android thing that was your your next job that you had was when you no 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 the same job just different project oh, okay so when did you finally, so the job you're at currently is the one that you got <clears throat> after that first job? Yep. So what are you, what are you doing now at this, this new place? Well, it's tricky because uh, Hungary has a concept of uh, a particular type of freelancing. I don't uh, want to go into too much detail on that, but oh, okay. I work for various places. They want Android related stuff. So mm -hmm. right now we've wrote a few apps. <laughs> that's pretty much it. So that's like, okay. So you can't say much about it, really. No, nope. is what you're saying. Okay. Now that sucks. You know, uh, that's a that's a that's a really crappy thing about like interviewing somebody who's currently working at 
at a place, they can almost never talk about that place. Like if, if I was to interview uh, some guy who's working at Google or I interviewed Aiden Follestead, I don't know if you know him, he couldn't talk about anything, which which really sucked. But um, when if you ever quit, then we'll do an interview and we'll talk about <laughs> all the things that you hate and love about that place or whatever. Uh, yeah, workplace discussion is tricky. Like uh, even when you are switching jobs and currently you're angry at your previous workplace for whatever reason, you can't really say negatives, even though you're clearly quitting for a reason. Yeah, but uh, you, you probably shouldn't. It's not a not a good idea. But uh, I don't really like talking about the exact project itself. Like I show that to people like this is the thing I worked on and then it's on my phone, but I don't really link it to people and stuff like over the internet. I'm like, yeah, technically we were executors in that regard, not uh, the owners of the code base. Like you write the code, but they own it. So I'm like, right. So I worked on it. I tell people that, well, I worked on that, but uh, it's not mine. So you wouldn't you wouldn't be interested in sharing some of the apps here today that you have worked on? I don't intend to, especially because the ones that I really was proud of at the time. One of them is internal use. The other one is uh, well, it had relevance in 2017. Now the servers are down. You cannot even look at it. Like, oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> even though the code base was, set, I was so proud of it. We were like two people working on that Android client. Uh, it was mostly just downloading and displaying stuff in really fancy ways, filtered in really fancy ways. And um, that's pretty much what it did, but that's what most apps really do, <laughs> apparently. So, um, but it really was, it, it works so well. This, this is actually why whenever I'm like, we have an offline first app, so we should use a repository. And like, <laughs> repository never comes up. Like, you write the code and it just, doesn't start happening. Like you have a job queue that executes these uh, synchronization jobs that can fetch data. You can use either one-time work request with work manager, or you can use, well, we used Android priority job queue beforehand, and I was told not to use it in this project. So I just wrote something that did the same thing. Um, so they have different constraints. So I just, don't really see why anyone would want to bind them together as a single interface. Like, um, so they're, you're, they're not the same. <laughs> so you don't, you don't. I, I, I want to make sure I heard you right there. Did do you don't use you don't use caching to? Uh, that's send not what I said. I thought. Yeah, sorry. I, I, that's what I mean. I want to make sure. It depends on requirements. Right. Like, oh, okay. uh, because uh, if you have a local database, then yeah. you don't really need caching because it's already in the database, so you can observe for changes. So yeah. then you don't have an in-memory cache because why? You will just get it like 200 milliseconds later. That's not so bad. Yeah. So that, yeah. So that would be like comparing, you know, observing something from a view model as opposed to observing something from room. It might be 200 milliseconds slower, but it's still, you know, very similar. It's a very similar thing that you're doing. Well, <laughs> uh, it's a bit tricky in that regard. Like, uh, because what people generally seem to do on with the Jetpack stuff is that yeah. they have a use case that is called, no, it's the other way around. It, they have a use case that calls the repository and then, how do you guys do it? I always mix it up. I even mixed it up in that uh, anemic repository MVI medium article that I did. Because are you talking like, about are you talking about like clean architecture? How the yeah yeah yeah. Uh, so you have a use case, and then you your repository would be a dependency to the use case, and then you have the oh use yeah the use case it's called the repository, and then the repo the DAO, and then the DAO the database yeah. yeah. By the way, uh, I always mix it up because they are like mixed. Um, how do you call it? I had the word on my tongue a second ago. Uh, take, take your the time. concerns, the, they have shared concerns, right? So like uh, whenever you have a use case, it's for whatever reason, and I'm calling just the repository method, it's just delegating. It doesn't do anything else. Yeah, right, delegate, right, right. It just delegates it, yeah. But why? Why does the use case not you know, know anything? And it's because the repository already knows everything. So then the question becomes, well, which one do I not need? Because apparently there's this thing that doesn't do anything, right? Mm. It, it's actually a code smell. It, there, there are code smells. I learned this from Sandy Matz. She has a video. I learned of Sandy Matz from Vasily Zukanov. He's great. I learned a lot from some of his videos. So you should check those out. What's his name? Um, 
Vasily Zukanov, you know him. <laughs> oh, Vasily. Oh, I thought you said something Vasily, else. Vasily, yeah. Yeah, no. I, I, I read Vasily stuff. I, I love I love, I love, love Vasily. He's he's great. He's entertaining. He's got good opinions. I don't necessarily agree 100% of the time, but I'll still you read it. <laughs> I don't have to. Yeah, I mean, it's his good time. I mean, even if you just take 80% that's useful and 20% you don't agree with, you learn the 80% stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that's great. So uh, what I, got... I was originally pointing to was Sandy Matt, because if you ever watch Vasily's dagger tutorial on Udemy, then he mentions that you should watch this talk called Something is Nothing and it will make you a better developer. Now, technically, that is a good talk. The one that really helped me was All the Little Things, also by Sandy Matz, which is uh, I think I've showing. Seen that one. Yeah, I have seen it like 12 times. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's this guy's it's name? San Sandy? Not guy. Uh, Girl, Sandy. Sandy, yes. how do you spell Sandy her last Matt. name? Uh, Matt, uh, like M E T Z. M E T Z. Hey, there's Vasily right there. Oh, it's Vasily. Hello. Yeah. He's sending love. Hey, you know, I've, I'm seeing a trend in the chat, so I think I'm just going to come out and ask you because I was planning on asking you eventually anyway. So, okay. uh, what do you think about Flutter? Have you spent any time with it? I haven't spent time on Flutter. Like, ah, uh, damn. I always I look at it. I always look at it. In fact, I saw this video by them about keys that was very interesting it was like most of the things always work except when they don't so in that case you should always know about these keys that you can provide to this list so it knows exactly how to diff your stuff internally otherwise you will get very erratic behaviors and sounds, like, like multi -binding. sounds like multi-binding sounds like multi-binding no 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 it's really just like uh they have a diff util like thing but mm -hmm. it's internal to their list so the, to their rendering frame engine, I think, to be honest. So uh, you can configure that from outside. So you can run into strange bugs with that if you don't know how it works. And I was curious about it because I was like, hmm, if I ever had to use Flutter, because there are use cases for Flutter. If I had to use Flutter, what would it take to make it work across process that, right? So that, that's the that's most the kind important of things thing. I'm <laughs> that's the kind of things I'm wondering about. And it, you know, it's it's starting to really bother me because a lot of people ask me about Flutter and I really I don't even have an opinion because I just haven't <laughs> used it. So it's really starting to bother me. I feel like I'm going to... I'm holding back because I know it's going to take like a month. Like I'll need to spend like a month in the trenches with Flutter to really like get an opinion on it. And uh, I think I just got to do it. That's uh, I've been I've been holding back thinking like uh because it doesn't bring me anything. It's not going to give me any financial <laughs> return. It's not going to give me hmm. anything other than being able to talk about it. Which I mean, you already have a platform for selling courses. You could easily make a Flutter course. It's really hyped up by people. Although the five thousand issues are not as hyped, <laughs> close those. Oh, careful! I got close in trouble. I got in trouble for talking about those in my video. People, people got mad, real mad. I, I think I, they got mad about the title and not the content. <laughs> no, I think I got mad about both. But that was, oh, that, okay. was that was kind of the point. So that's okay. Um, oh yeah, I should tell you about the use case. Like two things, not not that use case. This use case, the use case for Flutter. Right? Mm. There was this guy. He was asking already about like, I have this uh, app design in front of me with like tinted shadows everywhere, and everything is like overlaying, and everything is shared element transitions. And she's like, I was trying for an hour to make a tinted shadow, but it's so hard. Maybe I should just use something else instead. And to be honest, I look at it and I'm like. Tinted shadows, man. That's like three days if you know what you're doing. <laughs> any, any, I think anything material design on Android is like it takes forever, and it's, it's that's the real thing. It's not even necessarily material design. It's just that drop shadow is not a thing on Android. Like they have elevation support, which is cropped by view bounds. Like there's supposedly this thing that says click to outline, and then you can specify a different outline. I tried making it work six times it didn't work i'm not sure where it went wrong to be honest so that's when we eventually the original solution that i am not proud of but it worked was that i exported the whole view as an image and fit xy it ah. underneath the real image to have a shadow <laughs> right 
Oh, I was works, like, this works. is the worst thing I have ever created, but at least it was reasonably fast. So eventually we were like, this is not maintainable. This is really stupid. So we figured out how to make the uh, shadow layer work on canvas with paddings and stuff, which is still not elevation, by the way. So that works if you have the right padding, but you need to have the right background or it will just be completely black. So <laughs> that's also a thing, Good but fact. eventually it worked, but you need software rendering for that and software rendering is slow. So you're like, okay, well that sucks. But uh, that works for gray shadows, like with alpha stuff. If you don't want to just specify a drawable that causes shadow like alpha things to be drawn around your view. But if you want to tint it, then that's a whole different question. Then you are like using blur mask filters and whatever in canvas, and it's really messy. Like yeah. you don't want to do that. I, I stay away from cases, that stuff. But, but yeah, sometimes you want to stay away until it's like, but we want this. Yeah. And then you're like, OK, we'll do it. And then eventually yeah. it will happen. Well, the it client's paying for it. So <laughs> yes, I mean, you, gotta, you just tell them, hey, I can do anything. It's all a matter <laughs> of time. So <laughs> yeah, we have to figure out how to make it look like what you want. But sure. Yeah. So yeah, blur mask filters. But uh, in What's these a... cases, you start to consider maybe using Flutter and solving process that in Flutter is easier than getting these stupid shadow and transitions so, to work with material You know, the, the process depth <laughs> thing, because uh, obviously Flutter, I don't even have to look into it to know that Flutter's material, I'm going to call it material design, even though that's not really the right word, but material design is superior. Like it seems easier to handle, does cooler things easier, looks good. But the things that I wonder about is like, yeah, things like process death, configuration changes, caching data, co complex stuff like getting data from somewhere, caching it, observing the cache, refreshing the cache, all that kind of stuff. Like, is that easier just like the widgets are or is it not going to really work properly? I, I don't know. I, uh, again, I look at in Flutter, they have this block pattern. That's what they call it. In reality, it's just MVVM. I mean, <laughs> that, that's a fact. Like, uh, because the tricky thing about Flutter, and it's an interesting thing, and Compose shares this functionality, so it's going to be very interesting. Uh, they have this thing called a build context, right? I'm Flutter. And into the build context, you can put anything. So, in a way, it's the same thing. Uh, same thing, not really, but very similar to Android's context, because there was this trick back in the day that you could define an arbitrary tag that was not used by the system and then override the get system service in activity to return your own object instead of a real, get, uh, real system service. So with that, you could actually pass anything from an activity to any child view through the context. Oh, so okay. this is interesting mm -hmm. because Flutter does the same thing. With the build context, you say stuff like navigator.off context, and then you get the context. I mean, you get the navigator from the context. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you could always do that on Android mm -hmm. as well. It was just hacky, but mm -hmm. it worked. So Flutter does this, and it's interesting because through this approach, what they have as blocks are basically view models, and uh, everything they share in a tree of widgets is similar to how you could theoretically do this from the activity, either by knowing the activity by reference, looking it up through the contact chain, or through this gas system service thing, which is more similar to what uh, Flutter does. Caching yeah, and stuff. Yeah, stuff like that. That, that, that. I'm curious about stuff like that, too. Like, how, yeah, how does how does everything tie together in Flutter? I just, I don't know. I got to spend time on it. Sounds like you need to spend some time on it, too. Yeah, I haven't worked with it. I always just tell it, and I'm like, there's this use case. If I had to draw tinted shadows and I couldn't get away with this, <laughs> you're, holding, you're holding on to that. That you need that use case. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I wouldn't just want to throw my time at the yeah. framework and see what happens, um, because like, why? I want to use it for something. If I use it, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> I don't like to learn stuff for the sake of learning it. This is actually something that might surprise people because you said it would, that it would it surprises me that you're saying that because <laughs> listening to like the discussions I don't I don't I'm not really a Reddit guy, but I know that you're really active on Reddit, but yep. what listening to you on Twitter is just some of the things that you say in the conversations that you're constantly involved in make me go how does he have the time for this? Like the because <laughs> the answers are so detailed and 
I just I think type fast. That's the you, que- that's you the must. answer. You must. I type really fast. Yeah, your brain your brain must work fast too because there's a know. lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, Reddit, uh, Stack Overflow, Twitter. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of content there coming out of you. <laughs> well, I hope they're all all up to date and they are all true. Um, like uh, that might that might not be true. <laughs> who knows? Um, yeah. yeah, like uh, that's a tricky thing about software development. I was actually considering getting into this topic, and I'm glad that we did. I was thinking about it that we should. Um, mm-hmm. That uh, something that you don't realize when you start out is that uh, you write this code, and that code lasts forever, unless it's like thrown out and re- rewritten, right? But otherwise, it stays there forever. And if it just stays there, then you think, hey, I have this great sample. You can look at this sample. It's great. And then one year later, people are like, hey, I'm trying to use this sample of yours as the basis of my project. And it's like not really doing what I think because it's out of data and whatever. And I'm like, I don't really want to look at it anymore, you know. Yeah. Like I have the Realm book <laughs> example four years ago. It was great. I brought it out of spite because the Android Hive tutorial for Realm was like super bad. Like it was filled with Android patterns. So I wrote one that was slightly better. So people then come up later and they're like, hey, this project doesn't build anymore. I'm like, well, um, I don't want to look at it. it. <laughs> <laughs> not really, no. Yeah. So that's a problem with samples. Like uh, that's why I don't really like writing samples that often, unless by request. Like uh, there was this guy. He was like, uh, I want to find a sample with MVVM, RX, uh, but also live data, I think, and no dagger. And I was like, mm, sure, I don't know sample like this. That. But yeah, I I wrote him one. Like, oh, sure, okay. why not? Like, you, like see, sure. this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. This, like, where do you find the time just to do that? That's that's uh, that's a lot of work just to throw to get like hours for sure to just throw that together. A few hours, yeah, yeah, it's not a lot. Yeah, you're a nice guy, you are a kind, you are a kind soul giving back to the community. That's well, that's not there's that to it, there's also practice to it. There's also, um, mm, that's true. There was this one guy. There was this one guy. He says to me that uh, unit testing is important so that you don't end up with anti-patterns and static references all over your code. And I'm like, in reality, or at least where I worked, unit tests were not mandatory. Like, um, especially in UI projects. Like, uh, if because Android is uh, historically, it was always hard to test. Like now you have RoboElectric, which you may or may not trust. It's not really Android, right? So can you really trust it? But um, the point is that the guy was like, hey, this thing is filled with static references to text view and stuff. I wish they had done testing so that they would have realized that this is bad. I'm like, these two things, they're not necessarily uh, connected. Like. Even if you wrote tests that verify that, hey, did I run my async test synchronously? That doesn't help you. Like, uh, what you need to know is uh, what kind of thing breaks so that you don't do that. So instead, you do what works correctly. And you don't want to overcomplicate it. Uh, like, I like abstractions if they are meaningful to the project or if they are necessary. Like, back in the day, back six years ago, uh, back in the day. Back in the day. Back in the day. I was an intern. I was tasked with the following task. Here you go. Eliminate code duplication. That was my that was the task assigned to me. So I was like, sure, I can do that. Like we can use these generics and then these generic Ab- methods. Abstract classes and all these things. Well, yeah, that too. Like there was an interface, then there was a base class that did nothing but implement this interface. And then there was this other interface that extended from this interface. And then uh, the point is that by the end of it, it had 12 uh, generic parameters. Like I had a pub, uh, um, what was it? A generic method with 12 generic parameters, okay? <laughs> like you could configure it to do anything. Nobody understood what it does. And it yeah, didn't course, do though. anything interesting at all. And that code still exists, okay? So that's the real, uh, that that was what the, that, that was a real surprise to me. Like someone writes this code that is extremely complicated. They do extend and inherit stuff, inherit fields, inherit uh, things like just for one line, 
just for the sake of eliminating one line of code, you extend mm -hmm. from this base class. Now you cannot extend this other base class. So now you do these magic tricks and then this uh, goes all over the code base and you never get it out. <laughs> like, uh, because of that. So they I probably it, didn't, they probably just didn't want to refactor it because you, your, 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 your master class did so much that they were, didn't want to, they didn't want to go through it because it, it was like taking off layers of an onion. They take off one and they're like, Oh, there's 10 more layers under here. I'll take off another one. Oh, there's 20 more layers under here. And then they're just, they just close it up and just leave it. <laughs> yes. And the worst thing about it was that there was so much coupling involved. Like at the time I was like, Hey, this is a great idea. Like each time this entity directly represents this JSON response. So I can use a generic constraint to bind them together and they were bound together as independent concepts so that's literally the worst harm you can do to a code link together independent concepts so that's why it's tricky that uh who, which one am i thinking of uh, just a sec i'll give you one sec only <laughs> okay i try to <laughs> the right words then um, um yeah i don't know do you want to tell us about simple stack I'm, sure, I'm, sure. I, I want to. I want to know more about it because, I, like I said, it's been on my to-do list. Um, I think navigation is um, not the best in pretty much every regard. So I'm curious what you did with it. Uh, I don't use Jetpack navigation, but I look at it always as a competitor to possibly learn from I, or I, I don't steal mean, features from if they are good. I don't mean navigation. <laughs> I don't mean Jetpack yeah. navigation. I mean just nav all all types of navigation in Android. Oh. I, I just mean. It's it, in every way. It's not. It's never what I want it to be. So I'm curious what what you did with your simple stack. Oh, okay. So this is an interesting story. It ties back to my previous workplace and the times where it was still fun and exciting, and we created all these cool projects. So the first project, the first first real Android one, we were like no fragments, activities, and views only. Mm -hmm. Like we needed uh, custom views, which I learned based on Insta material from Frogger. I'm not sure who he is exactly, but Insta material was this project that greatly inspired us in how to actually do Android properly. Two things actually: Insta material, the not the one with the material implementations because that's a waste of time. The one where they do it without any material stuff. They just, they do circular reveals with canvas, draw circle, animate the uh, radius and stuff. It's really, really interesting how they just, there's this really cool animation where it pieces together and it's all done with object animator. It's so cool. Um, so that's one. And the other thing that really uh, contributed to our views was the advocating against Android fragments back in the day, because Square had this article on how they're not using fragments at all because they don't need it. They have uh, views instead, and they have these frameworks called Flow and Mortar, which at the time were a thing. They are not a thing now. Um, but what's important here is that our first project was multi-activities. And multi-activities cause you grief because of intent flags. Like uh, you cannot know, or at least I personally don't know if you can actually ask the system, like there's probably package private API, but uh, you don't really see it, what activities there are in your task stack. So uh, you never really know where you are and where you oh, came from unless so you it, passed everything over with the intent bundle. So you can't differentiate between, if, if you have an intent, you can't differentiate between an intent if that intent is an activity intent. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, what I'm saying is that if you have a history stack, like yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, a stack an activity of, stack of A, B, yeah. C activities, yeah. and you have like A, C, D, then if you come back after process that on D, you okay. don't know about C and you don't know about A. Okay. Like you don't know about them. You don't, okay. So you go back and they restart from scratch. You're like, everything is nulled out. There are no static variables. They are all null. It restarts on the third screen in your app. Mm. So you go back to the second screen and it restores itself from the saved instance state, assuming that people didn't assume, oh, saved instance state is for rotations. I don't use rotations, so I don't need to handle on saved instance state. Very common problem. Um, yeah. So assuming you restore there, that's great, but you still cannot reliably know where you are. And what's even worse, in my opinion, is that um, 
if you want to navigate from like ABC to A, you can do two things. You either use single top on A so that you can clear top there, or you mm -hmm. use a clear task, new task, which just flickers. It has this flicker animation. And I'm okay. not sure if you can do anything about that. So instead, so that it actually looks nice and is easy to reason about, there's simple stack, which is originally based on square flow. Right, I wanted to talk about hold that. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. So hold okay. on, I, I, wanna, I wanna clear my thoughts before we move forward. Okay, so fragments are not ideal in a lot of scenarios, but uh, activities you've highlighted and said that your main problems with activities is restoring from process death. You don't know what activities you had in the stack afterwards, yeah. right? Okay. Yeah. So you don't know where you are. And right. Okay. Kind of sucks. But okay, it's mostly so the intent flex, to be honest. Like uh, navigation is always not convenient in that regard. Like I had this navigation that I needed, that I have A, B, C, D screens, mm -hmm. and I need to have a stack of A, E. Like just kill B, C, D entirely oh, okay. and have uh -huh. E on the front. And if I press back, I want to go back to A. Okay. Doing that with activities is really, really hard. Yeah, actually, now you say that. Yeah, I don't even. I don't. Yeah, because you you don't you don't have access to that stack. You're not. You, you don't. Can't, you can't. You can't do anything to it other than you navigate forward or backwards, which might work. But yeah. It usually doesn't unless you have the right launch mode, and you don't want to mess with that as much. You, so you could like, clear the stack and then restart. But that that's the only yeah, thing I can think. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's not a good option. I mean, sure, you can deep link anywhere you want. Just use task, task stack build managers if you had to like deep link from a notification. I don't know. Even that's trickier with like uh, activities. I'm like, eh, screw this. Okay, so, so where would you go with simple stack? Yeah, let's hear it. To understand simple stack, you need to know about flow and why it was created. Okay. So the trick is that Square realized that. We don't need the fragment manager's back stack, which is a stack of fragment transactions. It's not a stack of fragments themselves. It's transactions, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't need this. Instead, uh, back in the day, fragments were buggy as hell. So they were like, we don't need fragments at all either. So instead, uh, yeah, they fixed a I'm lot of kidding. things. <laughs> they, they actually fixed a lot of things in fragments. Like uh, now, after nine years, you can to the animation, where is my hand? This is where my hand is. Okay. You have this screen, and yeah, this will work. So this screen goes on top of it, and it then goes down. This is a thing you couldn't do with fragments for nine years unless you inverted the draw order. Like, this is something they did in React Navigation. I saw that kind of, I was like, I never thought of this as an option. Damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> so, to not have this problem, because this is actually really common. Like, there's this result screen, it pops in from below, and then it goes back. And you couldn't do that with fragments. Like, eventually, you could do it on API 21. Like, have a higher uh, Z value for the background view of the top fragment. And you're like, that's a hack, dude. Like, yeah, no. that's definitely a hack, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Another option was that just don't remove the one behind it. Just add the other one on top of it so that it will animate correctly. And I'm like, but I want to use the replace that to best like, like literally everywhere else in the app. Mm -hmm. Because I don't want to have that fragment behind it, right? Now I have to remember that the fragment that comes on top, its root container must be clickable. Or you can actually click through the result <laughs> screen and press buttons on the fragment behind it. So I had that happen that. to me. I had that happen to me before, and I was like, "What the? How is that a thing? Why is why am I able to do that? I thought that was so weird." <laughs> yeah, I mean, they are added on top of each other, and nobody yeah. consumes the click, so it goes yeah. through. Like, why well, not? Well, yeah, well, you, you, it becomes obvious if you don't put a background color to the layout of the fragment, and then you put a fragment on top of a fragment, <laughs> and you could just see right through them. It's like a, a, yeah. a ghost. <laughs> It actually happens all the time with people who use add as the initial fragment transaction, but don't use the if save instance state equals not, which is the mm. only place where you actually want to do that is the initial fragment transaction. If you don't, then you will have overlapping fragments. Right. <laughs> so uh, simple these stack. kinds of things, simple stack, 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 yes. So originally, simple stack was made because mm. Flow had three different versions, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and 1.0 alpha. And 
they all had their own problems. Like we we tried to make them work so much. Portal was buggy. Like the problem was that you could if you navigate it forward and back, then it wouldn't persist the state of the view that you navigated away from, but it would try to restore the state of the mortar service from the on-save instance state bundle. So what you did is that you put the app in background, you brought it foreground, you navigate, uh, you switch to a different month because this was a calendar where this was reproduced. You switch the other to the other month, you tap on a day, it opens, you go back and you're in the previous month, not the one you were on because on-save instance state never happened, but mortar overrode the state that uh, was currently supposed to be reloaded, right? Because on save instance, they saved it, but your navigation did not, but the navigation also killed the screen as you navigated forward and then back. So I'm in order I'm to- confused. I am, I am, okay. I am confused. I am confused. Mortar is what you called it? M-O-R-T-O-R? So yeah. this this more it it saves state it saves navigation state some kind of navigation state. It was saving the state of the presenter associated with the view. Okay and okay and that and 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 that does not need to be saved to the saved instance state. It saves yes, it its own does. State. Oh, it does. Okay, it does, and that okay. works. But it okay. would have also needed to be saved when you navigated away from the screen and this presenter died. But that never okay. happened. Like nobody okay. did that. Mortar okay. had no idea about it. Okay. And you couldn't make Mortar know about it. That was the problem. Okay. So you couldn't make, you couldn't fix Mortar. So okay. originally I created Simple Stack as a, it was called Demo Stack originally, to be honest, because Demo it was for a series of Medium articles that explained how to create your own back stack. But as you piled on more stuff that you would have needed, it eventually became a library nobody else wrote except for Square. So I was like, OK, well, this is better than what we have now. So I guess it's time to rebrand it and make it a library. So it became a library. Uh, and so yeah, Simple Stack originally inherits the ideas from Flow that you can represent your navigation history as one list. If you can do this, then simple stack is for you. If you cannot do this because you have multiple stacks, mm -hmm. then it gets tricky. Like uh, it was based for the scenario when bottom navigation was even orig originally designed so that, um, la right, like in 2017, there was this pure Android section on uh, Google site on developer Android comp. And it said, don't use bottom navigation because it's very iOS-y. Right, so what then that before mean? it meant that it is alien to this platform, so don't use bottom navigation at all. Uh, so basically, said. basically, we we don't want to handle multiple back stacks. That's it, it. Wasn't even that originally. It was that there were no bottom navigation views because it was oh. not okay. common. In fact, it was like a from on, on the it's platform. A UI thing. Yes, they just, it's a they UI don't... thing. Okay. And as such, they didn't need multiple stacks at all, ever. Yeah. So this changed in 2018, but the material guidelines still said that if you switch between tabs, then they should just forget what they have. And people didn't like that because on iOS, it retains the state. So uh, it, it feels depended. better. I think it feels better. Like as the user, it feels better to be to have multiple back stacks, but that's from a user perspective. But as a developer, it makes it so much harder. It like yes. it multiplies the complexity of navigation times like a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say it squares it by the number of tabs you have. <laughs> like, I'm you have using easy number hundred. Square that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, about that. Like uh, it. So at the time, Simple Stack was created in 2017 to fix the problems of Mortar because like I started building this demo stack, but in reality, it ended up fixing all our, all our problems with Mortar. So that's where it became came from. And uh, it's been developed since according to stuff that I found that we needed in while developing whatever. For example, previously we could use Room to share data across screens and we didn't have complex workflow spanning multiple screens where the user inputs form data and stuff. That is why scoped services appeared in Simple Stack in 2018, like the summer of 2018. So that's what lets you share uh, data between screens in such a way that you can actually hook into 
the uh, state persistence mechanism of simple stack by implementing an interface bundleable and it automatically calls to bundle from bundle for you and then you can just save the state like that That's so, cool. so you can share state between screens that don't share anything else yeah and kind of so it's kind of like view model plus safe state handle right but it was written in 2018 instead of like being released publicly 18100 in 2020 because if the, the safe state model was released in January this year. So uh, I needed something before, like this was a problem two years ago as well. So that had to be mm -hmm. written. Yeah, Would I save... switch over the safe state handle? Not really because it's clunkier to set up. Like you either implement this optional interface. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. Hold on. I want to. I want to just. I want. I want people to be uh, to know what you're talking about because you went through that really quickly. So just so you guys know, he's talking about a mechanism to save state across different screens. Um, he's he's he was talking about uh, Android. The Android team came out with this saved state handle thing, uh, 2019, I think you said. Yeah. So this is a way. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a way to save the state of the view model to persist across process death. Everybody knows that view models are meant for configuration changes. The data still stays. If you config, uh, do a rotation, the data is emitted back to the UI after the configuration change. But if you have a process death, that data is lost. So you have to save it to the instant state or you can use this thing that he just mentioned called saved state handle. Um, so he, now he's just talking about why he wouldn't use it, this new saved state handle thing. I mean, I don't use view model either. Like uh, the trick is that because I had these requirements in 2018 and it's built into simple stack in such a way that, okay, this is the trick. Like uh, this is an implicit conversion between two constraints. If this is not your scenario, and I know it's not the scenario for Badu because I talked to the guy behind Badu who was working on ribs and MBI core and stuff. I know this would not suit their requirements. But in simpler applications, like the ones we were working on, if this is something that you can live with, then it solves a lot of issues. So based on your navigation history, I can set up your view models for you. Like you register that if this screen is active, then it belongs to this scope. And in this scope, these things exist, like uh, one view model or multiple view models. It's up to you, really. And these things are automatically created. You get a callback when state is restored. You get state restoration callbacks uh, through bundleable. And you're also told when you navigate it away from the screen, and this thing should die and undo subscription. So it's like uncleared in view model. In fact, you even have uh, the concept of activated services, which has caused a few bugs, but they are fixed by now. So this um, is all part of your simple stack. Yes. That sounds so cool. That sounds it, really cool. It's like view model, just a bit yeah. easier to use. And 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 more and more configurable. It sounds like it sounds like you. Have, I think so. <laughs> it sounds like you have more control over what you want to happen and when. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that that was the primary thing about simple stack data. Uh, I don't want to prescribe what happens when your application state changes, right? Like uh, what you even use for navigation. I don't care about it. Like you can make it work with fragments, views, or conductor controllers. It's up to you. And why is that possible? Because simple stack internally, all it cares about is that it has a list of parsable objects that can describe your screen and can therefore uh, tell you what screen to recreate after process that. that. That's what it does. Like This is what it manages for you. And I could build this coping mechanism on top of this list. Hmm. But um, Sounds cool. That sounds really cool. It, I'm interested. It works well. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh, man, I really want to. There's so many things I want to do. There's so many things I want to play around with. It's just like a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you choose what you spend your time on. Yeah. Like uh, sometimes. Hey, hold, hold on, hold on. Let's let's answer this question. Oh yeah, there this was guy, a question. This guy paid. I don't know how much it. money that is, but sure, let's answer it. <laughs> it might be like between coin and dagger for the AI. Okay, that's an interesting question, especially in regards to what other frameworks you already use, because. In our case, as my as I mentioned, in simple stack, you'll you'll be surprised, but this is relevant. Okay, so in simple stack, you have these scope services that you can look up based on a string tag, and that's because I have to register the service for 
a given string key in order to put that uh, services state into a bundle and then be able to restore it. Like this uh, tag has to be unique. So if you use the class name as the tag, then you can actually write methods like look up this uh, like a template, template parameter, this particular type of class from SimpleStack's backstack. So you're like, OK, I have a service locator, apparently. So if you look at it that way, SimpleStack scoping mechanism and view model stuff, it actually evolved to be a scoped service locator. And this means to me that if I need to use Dagger because I have a multimodal application where there are classes that I don't know because they're yeah. in different modules, but I have to multi-bind them together in order to work with them because I don't want to hard code the activity names. I don't want to do even magical stuff that does the same thing, like reading the Android manifests for activity class names, which is apparently something that people did. There's a lot um, of things you, yeah, to get. There's a lot of things, different ways to do the thing you're talking about. If you, if you, with a multi-module project, I'm, I'm just learning about this right now. A lot of, a lot of things. I what like. I like, though, is that uh, the Badoo guys, I was telling them, hey, multi-binding is amazing. It solved this problem when you need a class that you don't know, except it's exposed by a common. It's exposed by its type, but you only know its super type. So the consumer side can get it through the type that it knows, and then Dagger can inject it with other stuff from other modules because you instruct it to be able to do that. <laughs> That's what confusing yeah. sentence but what yeah. matters here yeah. is that the bodu guys were like we have 100 modules and we never needed multibinding what exactly right <laughs> <laughs> so you're like okay i guess there's probably an anti pattern here if they in their scenario where they have nine apps in development we know about two of them but they have more of them and they are I'm sharing it i want to know how they did it because like yeah, it's magical. Uh, I, I unfortunately, I don't work for them. I just talk to them about it. I was talking to the guy. He was like, "Hey, uh, I mean, I told him that hey, this this stuff that I tend to talk about, single activity, views only, or fragments only, like just one activity. You don't need a second activity. People look at me like I'm from the moon." I look at your stuff and you're from Jupiter, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody knows what this stuff is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, because I've been playing around with dynamic feature modules, and it's what is there's there's three ways that you can get a reference to like the because the the top mo, like the modules can't talk to each other, right? So you have like the top module. Oh, there's my alarm. Um, Sorry. The top. Yeah, now I lost my train of thought completely. Oh, great. What module? Right, yeah, you, they can't talk to each other. So to get a reference to the class, you can either use the like create a service locator basically to look it up. You can use uh, dagger multi binding, and then there was a third. There's a third way I can't remember, but they're all like very mm -hmm. complicated, and they don't they feel service happy. loader. You're thinking of that. service loader. Sorry, service loader. Yeah, yeah, which is technically internally, if you look at it, it will it's also reflection. be a service locator. <laughs> it. They all do the same thing. They yeah, find they do the same thing. some common tag, and then you can get it without knowing the exact type, yeah, but you do exactly. see a super type. So then you can talk to it based on super type. The other half of this question says, would I use coin instead of dagger 2? Like, uh, as I said, dagger 2 solves the problem. I really like dagger. Like, back when I came from Spring, I was like, hey, I can do auto wired and component. This is important because I originally tried to use dagger, and then eventually dagger 2 because I was like, Spring gives me DI. This is really great. We need to have this on Android as well because it simplifies things so much, which is why I also am like, Dagger is so hard to use. Then you're probably doing it wrong. Like, don't you don't want to do stuff that makes your life harder. <laughs> Dagger was made to make things easier. <laughs> OK, so with that out of the picture, uh, mm -hmm. so I really liked it. Because if you have one singleton component and you don't use subcomponents, you only need those on multimodal projects. And if you saw my comment at some point on Reddit, there are many, so you probably haven't. I also stated that 50,000K lines of code, it still works fine in one module as long as your builds are incremental. Like you don't have to slice it up. 
unless it becomes a problem. But people are like, hey, I have these free modules for 6,000 lines of code. And you're like, you don't need that. <laughs> like, you really don't. Yeah, and that's, that's one thing that I, I really regret when I made my Dagger course, because I wanted to show people how to scope and how to make subcomponents and things like that. But I, I didn't tell them enough in the course that in a, in a project this size, don't do that because you just don't need to. You're going to create a huge amount of complexity for not much payoff. Because that's you're, you're right. That's where it gets complicated is when you start messing around with, with subcomponents. Because if yeah, you just have a single component, it's easy. You put all your shit in there and that's it. You're yeah. done. <laughs> and you just put inject singleton inject on your class, like, right? Uh, like you put singleton on the class, you put yeah. inject on the constructor. Yeah. You don't write the module provides for this because it already has an inject constructor. So Dagger knows how to work with it. That's important. Uh, so you don't need a module if you already have the inject on the constructor. Uh, so once you have this, you just put singleton, inject, and it works. It's like component auto-wired, and it works. So it was exactly like Spring, and I loved it. So that's why I was like, you don't really want to mess with subcomponents unless you're certain that that's what you need. If you need component dependencies, because it's like the inverse of subcomponents you also inherit but only expose binding blah 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 um that works it's great like um if you need it like there was this project like four years ago we were experimenting with it it was total overhead it was totally not needed uh if you were to use the uh, simplest x uh, scope services you would probably also have unscoped services provided by dagger and you add it to simple stack and then you still just delegate over to the scoped service locator because that thing is managed by simple stack it gets callbacks it gets safe state persistence blah 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 so the second half of this question more so the first half of it is Coin, would I use coin? Uh, the trick is that dagger, as I said, I really like it, but you need to use capped for it in Kotlin, and capped is slow and it causes caching bugs, apparently. The bugs that I attributed to data binding actually also happen with dagger, and it happens because of capped. So capped slows your BS down. This is why dagger reflect exists. Jake Barton wrote it. I don't know if it's completely feature complete or not, but uh, it helps with the bio speed uh, the degradation that comes from uh, using capped in your project. So back to coin, I always tend to say that if I needed a scope service locator with one singleton component app global, like there's this one coin instance app globally, you're configuring it with coin that starts coin and it sets up that singleton component public static in the wild. It exists somewhere. Uh, if I were to do that, I would end up writing my own service locator, which is what happened. If I need a service locator, I ended up with one, and that service locator gets lifecycle callbacks based on your navigation state, and it gets safe state persistence. So that's the reason why I'm like, well, I'm glad for coin and everything, but I don't really need it because yeah. it provides scope services without safe state persistence. You can only do safe state persistence with it if you use view model and safe state handle. But what if that's not what I want, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, yeah. you have to open into the Jetpack ecosystem for that. And in one of the projects, the animations are way too complicated for fragments. So we use views for everything there. And in that case, you either rebuild the Jetpack ecosystem with the lifecycle registry and stuff, mm. or you just don't use it, which is the reason why we ended up with simple stack. Also, the safe state registry did not exist at the time, nor was yeah. it released, nor could it be used. So you have kind of a unique case. Like because you've built simple stack, you just wouldn't because you you have something that's already better. Yeah. That you built. So there's no reason. For but, our cases, it's better. <laughs> yeah. So, but okay, I'll I'll answer this question. I, I, I think coin is great. And um I would say, yeah, I mean, if you want to use it, use it. I don't think it's really gonna make a big difference in if you're gonna if you have a relatively small project you're using coin versus dagger, there's going to be no difference, whatever you think is good. Um, he just said the problem here is it opens you up to the, the Jetpack ecosystem, um, which then I would say, OK, yeah, I mean, that's fine, too, if you want to use view models. Uh, your last issue is how you're going to save instant state. He says he doesn't like to use the save state handle. I agree. I think save state handle is too complicated. I, I would sooner just save it to the instant state and say, you know, 
save whatever you have in your view model to the instant state, and then that gets rid of the complexity that save state handle brings. The trick there is that if you were to do it correctly, I don't know if you do it correctly, but the way to do it correctly would be to use an inline view model provider factory inside the activity. Like uh, right there, you are like object view model provider factory and create a view model there. And inside that method, the create method, you would restore based on the activity on create or the fragment on create saved instance state. Because otherwise you would restore even on rotations and you don't want that. Yeah, you only yeah. want this to happen when it's first created. I have never seen anyone do that. Like no, I don't. I just I res I just restore from the instant state. Um, yeah. So I, no matter what, it's from rotation or process death. It's still coming from the instant state. So what are you saying to do? You should you should use a. a Sorry, what? Sometimes that's a problem. I'm sure like, it is, but I'm curious. What it, I don't I don't know what the solution is. And you just mentioned something about uh, in the factory. The create. trick is that you don't use the map multi binding view model provider factory that Google did. I'm not even sure why they are doing that. There's no reason to do that. Each view model could easily have its own factory, yeah. and that way you don't need to bind them all together or anything. You only need if you see the view model, you could also see its factory. So if you inject the specific factory for the specific view model, then yeah. you can invoke that or pass that in or whatever uh, right there at the call site. And at the call site, you actually see the saved instance state. So uh, what? Oh, just like right before where you where you create the view model inside of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like view model provider get. Uh, yeah. I mean, view model provider. You pass it the uh, view model store owner dot get. And uh, there, the factory you provide, if you provide a factory right there, then you see the saved instance state because you are inside on create. But you can still invoke a provider from Dagger because you can inject providers from Dagger, right? So, so how, do you you, say, how do you save that state then? Easy, on save instance state. So, oh, <laughs> you get okay. the, you always oh. save to on save instance state, but you only restore when it's first created. View model is save the saved instance state, but you only restore when it's first created. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. I might have to look into this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a nice trick, and nobody does that. So no, I've never to... seen that done ever. <laughs> exactly, anyway. because yeah. the GitHub browser sample is like, hey, here's that's... the map multibinding, but you don't need that. I think it's too old to be honest. Now the the hmm? I think the GitHub browser sample is like it's honestly I think outdated. Like at this point, I, I think it's it's like look, I still got value in it, but like it's it's getting dated. I think now. Yeah, yeah. Things are changing too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they are opting into flow, Kotlin flow, and stuff. I'm still surprised that they're doing that because like it's preview. You're literally putting flow preview on it, so it feels perpetually alpha. Even coroutines, there's still experimental coroutines API going on on there, even though it's like two years old already. Mm. So I'm like, everything in Jetpack is starting to feel perpetually alpha. And now it's only a question of whether, uh, <laughs> uh, is it is everything perpetually alpha or is anything really stable? I don't know, but I don't really uh, no. buy into Flow yet, to be honest. Like we're using Rx Java. And Rx Java is a great way to make your code unreadable entirely. If you're <laughs> not sure what you're doing, or if you're too sure of what you're doing, so there's this fair middle ground where you don't put state into observables like at all. You try not to use auto connect. You try not to use replay. You only try to use map filter, flat map, and combine latest, and sometimes zip, and pretty much those. Maybe distinct anti has changed because that's great. But um, otherwise. Do you want to? Um, so, I, sorry, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I did. I okay. was only planning to do this for an hour, and we've already oh, gone okay. gone over. So maybe we. Sorry. Could just, no, no problem. <laughs> we could do it again because I, I okay. can see. I feel like we could. I feel like I could sit here and talk to you for many hours. So I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure we could do this again. I have topics that we didn't even touch on. Like I, right when you said flow, I wanted to s s get into it, but I'm like, no, stop. Back I haven't worked with it enough, and just, just the other day stop, I was stop, stop. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> um, so let's just quickly go through this, and we'll find okay. any questions that we can bang out. Oh my god, there's actually a lot. Okay, I'm gonna seriously cherry pick these questions, and uh, okay. then, we're, then we're gonna go. Uh, yeah. So if you see any questions that you wanna you wanna go in on here, just uh, let me know. 
<laughs> Sweden hates MVI. Yes, I don't like MVI. It's MVVM with extra complexity. I wanna, uh, I, I wanna, I wanna. You know, it's funny you say that because I think MVI is MVVM with less complexity. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I want to answer this question. What's your thought on modularization and dynamic features? Okay, so a lot of you know that I've been working on a course with dynamic features and clean architecture, and I, I think you know, I'm just this. Don't take this for like, this is definitely going to happen or anything, but this is just what I'm thinking today, April 14th, 2020. This is just my thoughts today. I might not do the dynamic feature course anymore because I don't think it's production ready. That's the, I like, you can't write tests. You can't write UI tests in dynamic feature modules. Um, any Anytime you're using like what me and Gabor, Gabor, right? I said it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What we were talking about earlier, if you ever need to get references to classes that are not within the same module, it is, it's a nightmare. Well, it's not a nightmare, but it's comp it's complex. And I mean, just the UI testing thing alone for that reason alone, I don't think people are going to adopt dynamic feature modules anytime soon. So for me to do a course on it right now is probably not a good idea because I just, I just don't think people are going to use it in production not yet anyway. So that's my thoughts on it. I think it's great. Like I really like it other than you can't write UI tests and the, there's a lot of complexity around, um, talking between modules or module talking to the parents, that kind of stuff. So there you go. Gabor, do you have yeah. anything to say? I don't, I don't know if you. But I did mention that modularization is something you should look into if it solves the problem for you, mm -hmm. which people over exaggerate like uh kept is slow that is true so sometimes you want a slice of something but you don't want to slice everything apart unless it really is what you need so you're dynamic saying... features i haven't worked with them because our use cases didn't uh, rely on them there are cases where it makes sense like nobody uses this feature module but it's 60 megabytes like of course you want to download that later but then you have to take into account that you need internet access to access it yeah that's a yeah. thing. That is a thing. All right. See any other see any questions that you uh want to take on? Why does Reddit hate me so much? <laughs> Just above it. I thought you were like a Reddit celebrity. What are you talking about? People hate you it's on Reddit. It's the same thing as uh bit of a silly, like there are fans and there are haters. That's just oh, how okay. it is. Haters gonna I... hate is what you're saying. Exactly. So <laughs> fans are fans, haters hate. It's mostly because of how certain I type that MVI is extra complexity. People really dislike seeing that. Damn. Oh, that that particular subject is a is a <laughs> is a lot of uh, confrontation. Brings a lot of confrontation. Yeah, the most antagonistic remarks I get are either that or when I say that on, you should be handling on save instance state, and then people just like well, the flip the, out. The on save instance state one is a hundred percent true. I don't see how anybody. Of course, could... but they're not aware of this. So I don't they see think how. I'm screwing with them. Yeah. Well, actually, I thought you were screwing with me the first time I saw a comment like um, on one of my repos, I was like, this guy's screwing with me. I, the, <laughs> the only reason I took you seriously was because I, I went into my, I have a discord channel, uh, a discord chat for my members and Florian's in there. I talked to Florian all the time. And I was like, Florian, do you know this, this uh, Gabor guy or Zuinden? Uh, I know. Cause I knew he's on Reddit and I get, he goes on Reddit. So I'm like, I don't know this guy. Is he, he seems like he's being an asshole. I can't tell though. And he's like, no, no, no. hundred percent. He's he's a legend. He's he he has good intentions, and I'm like, oh okay, all right then. <laughs> I couldn't tell. Like from it's the tricky because I'm used to people flipping out when I break their code, which is like reasonable. They think it works, and then it doesn't. So at this point, I just like get a crash log, and I post the crash log, and that's it. Yeah, and that, I think that's what I you did. That yeah, it, that's what I do. <laughs> like, yeah, and if people are curious enough, hey. Hey, where did this come from? Then I tell them that this is how you reproduce it. And ah. then they're like, hey, why does this happen? And then I link to this post on Stack Overflow. And it's like, oh my God, now I understand Android. And it's such a great thing, but I don't put this everywhere because nobody would read it. Like right. uh, if you just put everything there, nobody goes through five links to right. understand what's going on. Right. So yeah. I, I, uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, you post a crash log, see if he's interested, if he cares or not. Basically, you're like, yeah. do you do you care enough to look and and look into this? No yeah. or yes? Yeah, <laughs> that's a, that's, that's a good idea. Do. That's effective. It was effective. It works if the other person is interested enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
What else is there? Sandimat video I mentioned. The one I really like is uh, what was it? All the little things. But she has other videos where she talks about quotes math specifically. So that's something. How do you keep yourself informed about new stuff? Reddit. I read people's code. I read the Android X code sometimes on Google sources. Like, for example, the Jetpack Live Data Coroutine Builder. I was curious about it because in Vasily's uh, chat, I was like, well, I've seen this in the talk, but I'm not sure how it works. So that's when I just look at the source code because it's openly available and it helps a lot because you see what they're doing down the hood, under the hood. So that's one thing. And uh, that's also one of the reasons why it's good that I answer and check questions on Reddit because it informs you of possible pitfalls and what people run into, also on Stack Overflow as well. So um, that's really much how Google I.O. talks, they come out and talk about the new stuff that's really uh, effective. Whether it's something you're going to use, it requires perspective, which you might not have at the time. Like I'm pretty sure I did not have understood the same things I understood now five years ago. So that's one thing. Like um, navigation looks really shiny, for example, uh, but you have to code so much in XML and conditional navigation is tricky. So, oh yeah, I wanted to mention this. Navigation 2.2.0 is actually getting fairly feature complete now that the backstack entries can have view models. That's actually interesting. The backstack uh, but, entries can have view models. That is interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how the navgraph view model stuff works because the navgraph is also on the backstack. And so the nav the nav backstack entry has its own jetpack lifecycle. Like they are building the same stuff as in Seems like stack. they're seems like yeah, I was just gonna say it seems like they're finally going towards they're finally realizing that we wanna save state and yeah. we don't we don't <laughs> and we don't want like to have to do all these bullshit things like yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So in that regard, the safe state handle is actually oh, an improvement. The default, great. like I think the easiest way to use view models, if you are going to use them, is to rely on their default implementation where uh, they provide you the application and the uh I don't know, what was it? And the safe state handle. Yeah. If you have this as your constructor, uh your two constructor parameters, then their default factory creates your view model via reflection. So that's actually really nice. I think there's a chance that that would be much less intrusive than the abstract safe state view model factories that you would have to multi bind based on blah, blah, blah. So, like, you know what yeah. I mean? You, you kind of lost me actually, but I, I don't exactly. Wanna, I don't, yeah. <laughs> no need to go into detail on that. It's yeah. just that getting the safe state handled into your view model should have been easier. That's the I problem. I still think that's the problem. it should yeah. have been a callback on view model. That should that's what it should have like been. Like get like get safe, need safe state handle. Get safe get safe state or something. Just like just safe state and restore state. Like on the navigator in navigation component, they have it. They have oh, it right there on safe state on state. That's what the navigator uses internally. And if you model had this, it would be trivial. Now that it doesn't, we could actually set it up by using the safe state handle if you somehow get it in there in the constructor but that is hard as we yeah. know yeah yeah so i think i hopefully answered this yeah i think so i actually forgot what the question was oh how do you keep yourself informed <laughs> shadow layer yes that's what we ended up using it's kind of slow but it works uh da -da -da -da. tinted shadows teach me master post a medium article i will read it and retweet it uh, material. Da -da -da. Yeah. Opinions on RAM. I don't use RAM anymore. I'm sorry. They are rewriting the whole thing. Check again when they have finished. They've been working on it for two years. Um, have you ever thought of switching to iOS? Well, I already need to keep up with Android, so also keeping up with iOS would be a lot Impossible. of time. Also, Impossible is the word. The Oh yeah, yeah, and you gotta you gotta buy a three thousand dollar laptop then. Yes, and an iPhone because I am an Android. Oh, that's user. right. This is yeah. my wonderful Pixel XL. It's great. How long you had it for? Uh, almost two years. It has a terrible battery life now for some reason. 
I, I you know I'm gonna give a, a non-sponsored shout out to OnePlus. They make the best phones. They straight up make. I've had this phone for almost three years. It's a OnePlus Five. This thing still hauls ass. It's crazy fast. Battery life is excellent. It's great phone. Maybe and they're, and they're, <laughs> and they're and they're good. They're priced reasonably too. Like so, I don't know. I paid eight hundred bucks Canadian. So U.S. That's like uh, six fifty or something U.S. And that was three years ago. That's good. Nice. Good price. MVM with data mining. Uh, Android architecture components is not an implementation of MVVM. The Jetpack team said so. It's a fraud in that regard no it's not a fraud but like, uh, don't think that much about mvvm mvp i used to think about it all the time three years ago then i realized that this is not the important thing build the abstraction you need not the one that is prescribed by some people somewhere who have some use case that you don't have <laughs> it's good advice yeah. use what makes sense to you yeah and in your use case like don't try to complicate your own life uh but also don't put everything into an activity because that's also complicating your right, life right like there's a balance cut things off where they stop making sense being together and don't couple them together this is actually a thing that i learned from vasili's uh most solid his solid tutorial there was this one concept he said that give me this eureka moment where he talks about source code dependencies, because in the UML class diagram, they had the inheritance pointing up. And I was like, wait, why is this not pointing down? That's the age old question. And it's because the arrows mark what is your source code dependency. So if you have interfaces that depend on each other, that's still spaghetti because you need all of them to work with them. So you add one interface here to detach these two things and stop knowing about it right like this kind of seems obvious but uh, and then you have people creating mapper impulse for mapper interfaces with generic parameters that provides no value same for base use case that has one method that's like suspend for invoke or whatever and you don't need that like you can write the suspend function in multiple things because they are completely separate things the you don't want to share implementation details between independent concepts unless it really is what you need you should be very uh, vigilant if that's what you need okay uh, yeah what else i got a, i got a question here on top on the screen okay async, async task is deprecated what you know it's reading this question to me makes it, it it really seems like even this question is like old like are people even still using it is there people yeah. who even think about <laughs> async task anymore that's what it seems like to me the reality is that people just two months ago or something i had someone asking me hey what's the recommendation for not async tests now and apparently the official official jetpack uh, thing says use coroutines i don't use coroutines i use rx java if you don't really want to use rx java i can definitely agree that you don't have to use rx java I learned Rx Java originally to answer realm related questions that included Rx Java. It's something that you can use, but uh, it's also really uh, easy to make curve. hard to read. Go terrible. Like it's yeah. painful to start with. And then you realize that, oh, this is the subset that makes your life easier. And this is the subset that makes Stay away it from. hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, with the right combination of things like behaviorally and combine latest, it's amazing. But if you start using window, throttle, buffer, whatever, it's, uh, it's so bad. Um, I, I like coroutines. I'm a fan of, I'm a big fan of coroutines. Um, it, I think, I think people say they're really complicated. I really don't think so. Uh, I, I would, if I was, if I was me or I was talking to me today and I was asking that question, what should I use for asynchronous work? I would answer coroutines 100%. So, <laughs> so you, choose, so you choose what to it look at. It says experimental and stuff and channels are still quirky and eh. I also um, like channels. I also like flows. I like it all. I like all that new stuff. I really need to read through that uh, coroutine documentation from start to finish. It's I started great. reading it at some point. I it's stopped good. at the midpoint. It's one of those things that I will get through when I really need to answer some question that requires that knowledge, or I need to work with it. These two 
I'm really player. impressed by Thanks. by the uh, their their tutorial their example set on mm. the Kotlin coroutine stuff. It's good. Like it's it really like you read through it, you go through the examples, you play around with it. It really you really I feel like I really understood it after that. So it's what good. What bugs me is the potential pitfalls. If there's this nuance misunderstanding from yeah. some point, like should I use a coroutine scope here or a supervisor scope? Can I even launch a supervisor scope inside a coroutine scope? And why am I even doing that? There are those things are the only. Up. But those are the only <laughs> questions. Like honestly, though, it seems like there's a lot. But there's like there's not just like that stuff. Like the inheritance, like the the child parent relationships. That's the only real like sort of complicated thing. And I'm not saying I'm an expert, but like I think <laughs> that that is that's where it gets complicated if it's going to get complicated. I need to answer this question with one additional extra information, which is that if you look for the following query on Google, Stack Overflow, Epic Panda Force, Async Task, Alternative. <laughs> You will find my answer, but I tell you that uh, you can use an executor and a handle. I mean, not handle, handler to like uh, delegate off to the background thread using the executor and then using handler to get back to the UI thread. And that's good for like 90% of cases. And if you need anything else, then you can add that to it. But just for like uh, regular background operations, you honestly didn't even need a sync tasks. I didn't know this for a long time because I was not aware of executors. I learned that I learned of them from a clean architecture tutorial thing like five years ago where the guy explained how to use callbacks and executors and all that stuff in use cases. And I was like, hey, executor, this looks really nice. I didn't know about this. So apparently that actually is a thread pool. You can just create it and call execute on it, give it a lambda and it executes and it works it's that simple and that's what async task also does under the hood except it gives uh cancellation support to some degree and uh, it also had progress notifications which you didn't need 90 percent of the time <laughs> so you typically ended up with void 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 async task or void void some response async task and you're like hey i need i have these two generic constraints parameters that i never use that's when if, you know if that you guys are looking for an example if you guys are looking for an example of executors which is what he's talking about right now um the github browser sample for uh from google they use it so you, you could take a look there i'll share my screen if you want to uh if you want to see let me just share this it's going to look like inception for a second here oh <laughs> damn and now uh, but if you this is the sample right here so github.com android architecture component sample if you go to the uh github browser sample this guy right here this this one they use executors for their asynchronous work so you could take a look at that also two of my courses do the local database caching course and the uh, mvvm introduction course they also use executors so you could look at that if you wanted to and uh yeah there you go custom layout manager send me a twitter message I can kind of help, but not with predictive animations. Uh, da -da -da -da. Um, let's just answer this last one, then let's go because we're okay. uh, we're going we're going way over the time that I wanted to go on. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but it's, it's not your fault. I think we had I think we had good content. This is oh, this is fun. I could do we this. have great I, questions. <laughs> I could do this for another two hours, guaranteed. But I really need <laughs> yeah. to, I really need to do some work. So yeah, <laughs> this Understood. is this is this is for fun. <laughs> so please tell me the future of native development when compared to hybrid technologies. Oh boy, uh, yeah, this is such a fun uh, topic because this this is why we had to write those web view based app. I mean that one web view based app like six years ago. They thought that hey hybrid sounds great. Let's go with that. Uh one thing to note about it is that one year later they were like, hey, we need these new features and this new design and should we reuse what we already have? And we were like um for double the price of a native app, yes. So instead we rewrote it to native and it was done in half the time <laughs> and it was much more reliable. So that was fun. Um, but uh, so that's, but we were using jQuery mobile, which came out, the version came out and then no other versions came out anywhere afterwards, like any time later, it, it just died out. So if I were to compare Ionic 
React Native, Flutter, Xamarin. Um, what else is there even? There was this one which was like, we are now publicly available, and then you never saw them again. But um, Xamarin only heard bad things about it. Xamarin forms heard even worse things about it. <laughs> I've heard, I've heard, oh, what are, there's Ionic too. That's another one, right? Yeah, Ionic, Ionic. Ionic uses Angular down under the hood, web tech, web views. It's probably decent. I mean, I haven't worked with that. Uh, if you know Angular, then it's great. Angular is this perpetually shifting stuff. Every half a year, they release a new major version, and it has oh, so much complexity. Like the learning curve is like this. I mean, just this, just straight up, always <laughs> straight up. Yeah. yeah, like that's one of those things where you need to need a complete understanding, or you're making a mess. So that's tricky thing. I haven't worked with Angular. I always looked at it because they have a very interesting navigation router. Like It does so many more things. It has the concept of guards, and I don't know. So it's a tricky beast. Uh, so if you want to opt into that, sure, web views are going to potentially cause you trouble, like uh, in regards that uh, I'm pretty sure that if you're creating a web view based app, it will not handle process that. Like the one we wrote, I don't even know about process that at the time, so it would have just restarted. <laughs> but I mean, that's the common mistake. You either assume that it will just restart on the first screen, or that um, we just don't know that it shouldn't be restarting on the first screen, or that it, oh, wait, how is this, how is this null? Oh, wait, why am I on the first screen? Why am I not on the splash screen, right? So, so that's like something Xamarin, to consider. Ionic, Xamarin, Xamarin forms, Ionic, React Flutter, Native, and Flutter. React Native, yeah. yeah. React Native. I always see that the two chain complexity is always lagging behind and people having really cryptic problems. There was this Medium article about how updating the SVG artifacts of React Native caused memory leaks and multi-threading problems in production. Like uh, it worked once and didn't work twice. And then they <laughs> had to fork React Native because the fix took six months. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, oh, who wow. did this framework? <laughs> so that's why Airbnb threw it out if we are to believe them because they were like, well, we had to fork it because the fixes we created, they were just not accepted. Yikes. That's that's such a pain if there's this open source thing and it's just not maintained anymore. Yeah, um, that is, that's a lot of work, it sounds like. No, thank you. But apparently there are people who use it and are happy with it even. It's, uh, I have not worked with React Native thankfully because like you get the complexity of the native stuff and the web stuff and their bridge. <laughs> like, in that regard, we did that in a small contained thing back with that first example where we just channeled out network calls and channeled them back in. You get this, you define a React component and it somehow magically becomes Android views or iOS views. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, who knows? You now need to fix your Shadow DOM. Right? <laughs> Have fun. That's um, one of those things. I would only start to work with it if I know that I'm going to get money for doing it. <laughs> you, yeah, you don't use React Native for fun. So, so <laughs> basically, <laughs> so basically, you've you've uh, you're very uncertain, I guess, and and you, you don't sound like you have a, a ton of experience with these uh, with these cross platform no, things. I was lucky enough to mostly be doing native stuff lately. Like mm -hmm. uh, the as I originally mentioned there is potential to flutter dart is really keeping it back because people just don't want to learn dart especially if they come from kotlin although now they have extension functions so one of the major things i said i was like i'm not gonna use Dart. it doesn't have extension functions my kotlin code looks so much better and then they come out with extension functions technically i could look at it now but you know i i, I, use this. I was i wanted to ask you one of the things i wanted to ask you i'm not even gonna ask you because we're gonna end up talking about it too long never mind no we, you should ask it no i don't think i'm you going do to do it no oh, that's a next shame. time we'll do this again how about we do this okay. again what did you have fun yes 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 yeah, I had a one good time. thing about Flutter, I need to say this one thing. Okay. Yeah. There was this guy. Yeah, I'm not sure about his name, but there's this thing called, on GitHub called Flutter Native State. It okay. lets you persist stuff from Flutter to unsafe instant state and okay. then restore it. And they use it to restore their navigation state. So it is possible, you just have to do it yourself. Like it's in 
entirely up to you to provide the right initial route to your navigator once you've restored from after process that. So it is possible. I just haven't seen anyone actually write the code in an open source setting. But the code that uh, easily makes this possible is open source. It's rather a Flutter native state. So if you use Flutter, you should look into that. I'm probably honestly, I'm probably going to end up spending like a month on it. I think I have to. <laughs> I'm I'm tired of people asking me or like just and then I have nothing to say because I just don't know. So it's starting to bother me enough that I'm going to have to spend some time on it. So Fair enough. Yeah. So anyway, thanks for coming on. I, again, had a really good time and I enjoyed getting to know you and hearing your opinions. And we should definitely do this again if, if that's OK with you. It sounds like uh, we got a lot of questions here, too. So probably a lot of people enjoyed you on here also. Yeah, I'm scrolling through these questions in case there's something that we should have answered. If you really wanted to ask something but was not answered, just tweet it at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tweet him. All right. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm ending the broadcast. I'm doing yep, it. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thank you again. See ya. See Thanks ya. for the invitation. Bye. Of course.